Today is day one for the Come Follow Me study for this week, September 9th through the 15th. Glad tidings of great joy. Helaman 13 through 16. Monday, September 9th, 2024. Helaman 13, 1 through 23. Look for patterns. A pattern is a plan or model that can be used as a guide for accomplishing a task. In the scriptures, we find patterns that show how the Lord accomplishes his work, such as sending his servants to warn the people. Prophets in every age have had a particular message and purpose for their time. I shall never forget the day I walked into my home to find my wife talking with two women who claimed to be representatives of God. I greeted them cordially, and then one said, So, you are a Mormon like your wife. Why, yes, I replied. Our whole family are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, she said, There is really only one difference between our church and yours. You believe in modern revelation, and we don't. We don't need a prophet today, for all that needs to be said is written right here in the Bible. Do you really believe in living prophets? Seeing a chance to bear my testimony, I said, Yes, I believe very much in living prophets. In fact, I know that God has called prophets in our day to guide and direct his children. With a look of disbelief on her face, she countered, Well, give me one good reason why we need a living prophet today. How would you respond? Perhaps the answer to this question can be found in the answer to another ever more basic question. What is the role of a prophet? Once we understand the role of a prophet, the answer to why we need one should be apparent. Using your study of Helaman 13 through 16, use the example of Samuel the Lamanite to discover the calling of a prophet of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ offers all people the opportunity to change. Throughout much of the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites' deeds had been evil. However, the preaching of the Nephites led the more part of them to receive the gospel and experience a mighty change of heart. Here in the book of Helaman is an obvious reversal of roles. A people who had once been taught became the teachers. Many Nephites, on the other hand, had become prideful and ignored their own prophets. So the Lord sent a Lamanite prophet to warn them to repent and prepare for the coming of the Lord. Look for the Nephites' collective and individual response to the Lord's Lamanite messenger. Samuel's words were important enough for the Savior that he endorsed them during his personal ministry in the Americas and testified they had all been fulfilled. The first time Samuel the Lamanite tried to share glad tidings in Zarahemla, he was rejected and cast out by the hard-hearted Nephites. You might say it was as if they had built an impenetrable wall around their hearts that prevented them from receiving Samuel's message. Samuel understood the importance of the message he bore and demonstrated faith by following God's commandment, that he should return again and prophesy. Samuel the Lamanite came to Zarahemla commissioned by an angel to proclaim God's word. For many days he attempted to give the Lord's message, but few would hearken. Was it because he was a Lamanite, come to teach the elect Nephites the gospel? Or was it his message, his teaching, that if they repented, they would partake of great blessings, even a personal visitation from the Lord. Whatever the reason, he was rejected, dishonored, and cast out from among them. Then came the voice of the Lord to Samuel. He was to return to Zarahemla. This time the message was to be of judgment and justice. Heavy destruction awaited the people, and nothing would save them except repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. The sword of justice hung over the people even as he spoke. Some believed his words and went forth desiring baptism. But the majority were angry and sought his life, for Satan had great hold upon their hearts. He hath a devil, some cried. Others reasoned that Samuel's words were not reasonable and that he sought to gain power over them. Little did they realize that in about thirty-eight years, many would be weeping and lamenting, Oh, that we had repented, and had not stoned the prophets and cast them out. Like Samuel, we all encounter walls as we prepare the way of the Lord and strive to follow his prophets. And like Samuel, we too bear witness of Jesus Christ, who surely shall come, and invite all to believe on his name. Not everyone will listen, and some may actively oppose us, but those who believe in this message with faith in Christ find that it truly is a message of glad tidings of great joy. The Prophecy of Samuel the Lamanite to the Nephites, comprising chapters 13 through 15. Samuel's warnings of the judgments of God consistently included a merciful invitation to repent. Look for these invitations throughout Helaman 13 through 15. Chapter 13 
Sam the Lamanite prophesies the destruction of the Nephites unless they repent. They and their riches are cursed. They reject and stone the prophets, are encircled about by demons, and seek for happiness in doing iniquity. About 6 B.C. In the scriptures, prophets are sometimes compared to watchmen on a wall or tower who warn of danger. Doctrine and Covenants 101. My indignation is soon to be poured out without measure upon all nations, and this will I do when the cup of their iniquity is full. And in that day, all who are found upon the watchtower, or in other words, all mine Israel, shall be saved. And they that have been scattered shall be gathered, and all they who have mourned shall be comforted. And all they who have given their lives for my name shall be crowned. Therefore, let your hearts be comforted concerning Zion, for all flesh is in mine hands. Be still and know that I am God. Zion shall not be moved out of her place, notwithstanding her children are scattered. They that remain and are pure in heart shall return, and come to their inheritances. They and their children with songs of everlasting joy, to build up the waste places of Zion. And all these things that the prophets might be fulfilled. And now I will show unto you a parable, that you may know my will concerning the redemption of Zion. And while they were at variance one with another, they became very slothful, and they hearkened not unto the commandments of their Lord. And the enemy came by night, and broke down the hedge, and the servants of the noblemen arose, and were affrighted, and fled, and the enemy destroyed their works, and broke down the olive trees. Now behold, the noblemen, the lord of the vineyard, called upon his servants, and said unto them, Why, what is the cause of this great evil? And the lord of the vineyard said unto one of his servants, Go and gather together the residue of my servants, and take all the strength of mine house, which are my warriors, my young men, and they that are of middle age, also among all my servants who are the strength of mine house, save those only whom I have appointed to tarry. And go ye straightway unto the land of my vineyard, and redeem my vineyard, for it is mine, I have bought it with money. President Ezra Taft Benson said, Watchmen, what of the night? We must respond by saying that all is not well in Zion. As Moroni counseled, we must cleanse the inner vessel, beginning first with ourselves, then with our families, and finally with the church. A prophet of God stated, Ye shall clear away the bad according as the good shall grow, until the good shall overcome the bad. It takes a Zion people to make a Zion society, and we must prepare for that. President Joseph F. Smith said, We labor day by day for the bread that perishes, and we devote but a few hours comparatively in seeking to obtain the bread of life. Our thoughts in great measure are placed upon worldly things the things that perish, and therefore we are prone to neglect the higher duties that devolve upon us as the children of our Father, and to forget in some measure the great obligations that rest upon us. It is therefore proper, and indeed it becomes the duty of those who are placed upon the towers as watchmen in Zion, to exhort the people to diligence, to prayerfulness, to humility, to a love of the truth that has been revealed to them, and to earnest devotion to the work of the Lord, which is intended for their individual salvation. And so far as they have influence upon others, the salvation of those whom they may have power to influence to move in the right direction, not that I can save any man, nor that any one man can save any other man or fit him for exaltation in the kingdom of God. This is not given to me to do for others, nor is it given to any man to be a savior in this sense or in this way to his fellow man, but men can set an example. Men can urge the precepts of the gospel. Men can proclaim the truths to others and can point out the way to them in which to walk. And if they will hearken to their counsel, listen to their admonitions, and be led by them, they themselves will seek the path of life and they will walk in it and obtain their exaltation for themselves. As you study Samuel's words in Helaman 13, consider how he is like a watchman for you. Samuel predicts the destruction of the Lamanites. Helaman 13.1 And now it came to pass, in the eighty and sixth year, the Nephites did still remain in wickedness, yea, in great wickedness, while the Lamanites did observe strictly to keep the commandments of God according to the law of Moses. How can you teach your children that God can speak to our heart, as he did for Samuel? Perhaps you could ask them to show you different ways to communicate without words, such as gestures or facial expressions. This could lead to a discussion about different ways that Heavenly Father communicates with us. 
As part of this discussion, you and your children could look at a picture of Samuel the Lamanite and read Helaman 13, 2 through 5, as your children listen for how God told Samuel what to say. Helaman 13, 2 through 3. And it came to pass that in this year there was one Samuel, a Lamanite, came into the land of Zarahemla and began to preach unto the people. And it came to pass that he did preach many days repentance unto the people, and they did cast him out. And he was about to return to his own land. But behold, the voice of the Lord came unto him, that he should return again and prophesy unto the people whatsoever things should come into his heart. Samuel, who was a prophet, did not take it upon himself to decide what to preach to the Nephites. We read in Helaman 13.3 that he taught whatsoever things should come into his heart. Concerning this revelatory process, President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, described how the voice of the Lord often comes. Revelation comes as words we feel more than hear. Nephi told his wayward brothers, who were visited by an angel, ye were past feeling that ye could not feel his words. The scriptures are full of such expressions as the veil was taken from our minds and the eyes of our understanding were opened, or I will tell you in your mind and in your heart, or I did enlighten thy mind, or speak thy thoughts that I should put into your hearts. There are hundreds of verses which teach of revelation. The prophet Joseph Smith said, the spirit of revelation is when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you. It may give you sudden strokes of ideas so that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. Those things that were presented unto your minds by the Spirit of God will come to pass, and thus by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. Helaman 13, 4-5 And it came to pass that they would not suffer that he should enter into the city. Therefore he went and got upon the wall thereof, and stretched forth his hand, and cried with a loud voice, and prophesied unto the people whatsoever things the Lord put into his heart. And he said unto them, Behold, I, Samuel, a Lamanite, do speak the words of the Lord, which he doth put into my heart. And behold, he hath put it in my heart to say unto this people that the sword of justice hangeth over this people, and four hundred years pass not away, save the sword of justice falleth upon this people. Where do prophets receive their message? Could our society benefit from a prophet who spoke directly with God? Many of us, especially children, need help learning to recognize how and when God is speaking to us. You might tell your children about a time when the Holy Ghost helped you know in your heart what God wanted you to do or say. Explain how you knew that God was communicating with you. Perhaps your children could also share any similar experiences they have had. Helaman 13.6 Yea, heavy destruction awaiteth this people, and it surely cometh unto this people, and nothing can save this people, save it be repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who surely shall come into the world, and shall suffer many things, and shall be slain for his people. What special message are prophets called to give to people? Is our society in need of this today? Helaman 13, 7-8 And behold, an angel of the Lord hath declared it unto me, and he did bring glad tidings to my soul. And behold, I was sent unto you to declare it unto you also, that ye might have glad tidings, but behold, ye would not receive me. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because of the hardness of the hearts of the people of the Nephites, except they repent, I will take away my word from them, and I will withdraw my spirit from them, and I will suffer them no longer and I will turn the hearts of their brethren against them. President Wilford Woodruff said, Joseph Smith visited me a great deal after his death and taught me many important principles. Among other things, he told me to get the Spirit of God, that all of us need it. He said, I want you to teach the people to get the Spirit of God. You cannot build up the kingdom of God without that. But how is it with the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost does not leave me if I do my duty. It does not leave any man who does his duty. Helaman 13, 9 And four hundred years shall not pass away before I will cause that they shall be smitten. Yea, I will visit them with the sword and with famine and with pestilence. Because of the righteous, the wicked are temporarily spared. 
Helaman 13.10 Yea, I will visit them in my fierce anger, and there shall be those of the fourth generation who shall live, of your enemies, to behold your utter destruction. And this shall surely come, except ye repent, saith the Lord, and those of the fourth generation shall visit your destruction. The Book of Mormon records in Mormon 6 the final destruction of the Nephites. This happened about 400 years from the time Samuel made this prophecy. Samuel, like all prophets of God, had the spirit of prophecy and revelation, which gave him power to discern the future. Helaman 13.11 But if ye will repent and return unto the Lord your God, I will turn away mine anger, saith the Lord. Yea, thus saith the Lord, Blessed are they that will repent and turn unto me, but woe unto him that repenteth not. Helaman 13, 6-11 What do you learn from these verses about repentance? Helaman 13, 12-14 Yea, woe unto this great city of Zarahemla, for behold, it is because of those who are righteous that it is saved. Yea, woe unto this great city, for I perceive, saith the Lord, that there are many, yea, even the more part of this great city, that will harden their hearts against me, saith the Lord. But blessed are they who will repent, for them will I spare. But behold, if it were not for the righteous, who are in this great city, behold, I would cause that fire should come down out of heaven and destroy it. But behold, it is for the righteous' sake that it is spared. But behold, the time cometh, saith the Lord, that when ye shall cast out the righteous from among you, then shall ye be ripe for destruction. Yea, woe be unto this great city, because of the wickedness and abominations which are in her. The earth is cursed to the Nephites. Helaman 13, 15-16 Yea, and woe be unto the city of Gideon, for the wickedness and abominations which are in her. Yea, and woe be unto all the cities which are in the land round about, which are possessed by the Nephites, because of the wickedness and abominations which are in them. There have been times the wicked were spared from terrible destructions because there were righteous people living among them. The wicked people of Zarahemla had the righteous people to thank for their preservation from destruction, though, of course, they did not know it. In a few years, Zarahemla lost this silent and unappreciated protection, and Samuel's words were fulfilled. Even Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared if only ten righteous people had lived there. How we live really does make a difference. The personal righteousness of a few can become a great blessing to others, especially to those in our own family and local community. Helaman 13, 17 through 21. And behold, a curse shall come upon the land, saith the Lord of hosts, because of the people's sake who are upon the land, yea, because of their wickedness and their abominations. And it shall come to pass, saith the Lord of hosts, yea, our great and true God, that whoso shall hide up treasures in the earth shall find them again no more, because of the great curse of the land save he be a righteous man, and shall hide it up unto the Lord. For I will, say the Lord, that they shall hide up their treasures unto me. And cursed be they who hide not up their treasures unto me. For none hideth up their treasures unto me, save it be the righteous. And he that hideth not his treasures unto me, cursed is he, and also the treasure, and none shall redeem it because of the curse of the land. And the day shall come that they shall hide up their treasures, because they have set their hearts upon riches because they have set their hearts upon their riches, and they hide up their treasures, when they shall flee before their enemies, because they will not hide them up unto me. Cursed be they, and also their treasures. And in that day shall they be smitten, saith the Lord. Behold ye the people of this great city, and hearken unto my words. Ye hearken unto the words which the Lord saith. When Samuel said, Hearken unto my words, wasn't he indicating that prophets represent Christ? Do we need representatives of the Lord today? Do we not need prophets to learn of Christ? Doctrine and Covenants 1. What I the Lord have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. At the time of the organization of the restored church, Christ spoke similarly. Doctrine and Covenants 21. Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his, Joseph Smith's words and commandments, which he shall give unto you, as he receiveth them, 
walking in all holiness before me. For his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. Helaman 13, 21 continued in 22. For behold, he saith that ye are cursed because of your riches, and also are your riches cursed because ye have set your hearts upon them, and have not hearkened unto the words of him who gave them unto you. Ye do not remember the Lord your God in the things with which he hath blessed you, but ye do always remember your riches, not to thank the Lord your God for them. Yea, your hearts are not drawn out unto the Lord, but they do swell with great pride, unto boasting, and unto great swelling, envyings, strifes, malice, persecutions, and murders, and all manner of iniquities. Never miss. Samuel, I thought you left the city. Stop! Did we not cast you out? Next time, we will not be so kind. Pass not away, save the sword of justice falleth upon this people. Nothing can save this people, save it be repentance and faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, who surely shall come into the world and shall suffer many things and shall be slain for his people. It is that layman that again. An angel of the Lord hath Perhaps this time to we should listen. And he did bring glad tidings to my soul. And I was sent unto you that ye might have glad tidings. But ye would not receive me. Thus saith the Lord, because of the hardness of the hearts of the people of the Nephites, except they repent, I will take away my word from them, and I will withdraw my spirit from them. But if ye will repent and return unto the Lord your God, I will turn away mine anger, saith the Lord. Blessed are they who will repent and turn unto me, but woe unto him that repenteth not. Hearken unto my words. You do not remember the Lord your God and the things with which he hath blessed you. Your hearts are not drawn out unto the Lord, but they do swell with great pride and all manner of iniquities. The Lord told the prophet Joseph Smith in the year 1831 that in nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things and obey not his commandments. Elder Andrew J. Peterson said, Samuel the Lamanite strongly reminded the Nephites that they had become casual and neglectful in living basic principles of the gospel. Living prophets of our dispensation have likewise reminded us to be firm and steady in the faith. Samuel said, Ye do not remember the Lord your God in the things with which he hath blessed you. President John Taylor said, Do you have prayers in your family? And when you do, do you go through the operation like the grinding of a piece of machinery? Or do you bow in meekness and with a sincere desire to seek the blessing of God upon you and your household? That is the way that we ought to do and cultivate a spirit of devotion and trust in God 
dictating ourselves to him and seeking his blessings. Helaman 13, 23. For this cause hath the Lord God caused that a curse should come upon the land and also upon your riches, and this because of your iniquities. To what did Samuel attribute the Nephites' curse? What did they remember and what did they forget? Why is this important in your life? Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles described the relationship between materialism and spirituality. Materialism, which gives priority to material needs and objects, is obviously the opposite of spirituality. The Savior taught that we should not lay up treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. We should lay up treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There is nothing inherently evil about money. The Good Samaritan used the same coinage to serve his fellow man that Judas used to betray the master. It is the love of money which is the root of all evil. The critical difference is the degree of spirituality we exercise in viewing, evaluating, and managing the things of this world and our experiences in it. If allowed to become an object of worship or priority, money can make us selfish and prideful, puffed up in the vain things of the world. In contrast, if used for fulfilling our legal obligations and for paying our tithes and offerings, money can demonstrate integrity and develop unselfishness. The spiritually enlightened use of property can help prepare us for the higher law of the celestial glory. Elder Bruce McConkie said, one of the great purposes of this mortal probation is to allow men to choose between the riches of the world and the riches of eternity. Those who set their hearts on the things of this world lose their souls. Woe unto the rich, who are rich as to the things of the world. For because they are rich, they despise the poor, and they persecute the meat, and their hearts are upon their treasures. Wherefore, their treasure is their God. And behold, their treasure shall perish with them also. For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Those who set their hearts on the things of the Spirit inherit eternal riches, which consist of eternal life. 1 Timothy 6 But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Psalm 119 Incline your heart into thine testimonies, and not to covetousness. Doctrine and Covenant 6. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall ye be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich.